So welcome and good evening, everyone. For uh, Thank you so much for joining us for our online webinar, our online seminar on the repeal of the death tax initiative. A quick disclaimer. So the uh, California Association of Realtors, CAR, um, and our local association, the San Mateo County Association of Realtors, is not taking a position on this initiative at this time. Uh, many of you, several of you may know that the Prop 19 was actually sponsored by this uh, California Association of realtors. Uh, and at that time, that was not a position that I was uh, for and uh, was trying to get the word out. Uh, unfortunately, it was uh, it was tied to, or fortunately, it was tied to a, a piece that was the main, main purpose was to try to pass the portability um, aspect of it, which is for people to be able to transfer their property tax base uh, when for uh, homeowners age 55 and older, as well as those who've been uh, affected by wildfire and other disasters, natural disasters. So there was that piece, which is really good. Um, and then there was this part, um, there was a second part, which has to do with inherited properties. And that's what we're, we're actually addressing with the repeal of the death tax initiative. So the portability portion is not, not being touched in any way, but it's really the, the, um, the inheritance piece that we're trying to address here. Uh, and again, the uh, CAR and also uh, San Mateo County Association do not have an official position on this at this time. So just wanted to put out that out there and let you know. Uh, this seminar is being presented with the intent of presenting information, providing information to our clients and neighbors about this so that you can take actions um, if you'd like to support it. And we'll be going through that as well today. Uh, so with that, I'm going to go ahead and hand this right over to Susan. Uh, Susan Shelley is the Vice President of Communications for the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers, Taxpayers Association, and they are spearheading this effort for um, for this initiative. So take it away, Shelley, as Susan. <laughs> Did it again. Sorry. Now that no I said, problem. I'm going to keep doing it. No problem. Well, uh, as Jean said, Proposition 19 had this thing in it, which a lot of voters did not know about and or, or did not realize the impact that it would have. Proposition 13 in 1978 was passed at a time of very high inflation. And the, the properties were assessed at that time based on their market value and the statewide average tax rate on that market value was 2.76% uh, or 2.67%. So at that, you can imagine paying 2.67% of the market value of your property every year as a condition of keeping it. Well, obviously people were having a very, very hard time, but the legislature was happy because the money was rolling in. So they didn't do anything about it. Howard Jarvis did something about it. He tried five times to put property tax limitations on the ballot and he finally succeeded in 1978. It became Proposition 13. It cut the tax rate from the statewide average 2.67% to 1% statewide, and it limited how much the assessed value of your property could go up during the period of time that you owned it. It was limited to a maximum of 2% increase per year. So if the market went up 10%, your property tax bill did not go up 10%. Your assessed value went up 2%, and your taxes were 1% of that new assessed value. And that's what we've had since 1978. Well, what happened, was in 1986, people had, inflation had driven these prices up so much on real estate that as people were inheriting property, they found that they could not afford to keep it because the new assessed value as a change of ownership, when the parents passed the property to the children, it counted as a change of ownership. It was reassessed to market value. The kids were having to sell the property when they didn't want to. The legislature addressed this by putting something on the ballot unanimously with a unanimous vote in both houses. They put something on the ballot that became Proposition 58. It was the parent-child transfer. And what it said was that parents and children could transfer a home of any value, their principal residence, regardless of value, plus up to a million dollars of assessed value of other property. So that could be a vacation cabin, a rental home, a duplex, a small apartment building, a small business property like a restaurant or a store if someone owned that real estate. That could be passed from parent to child without reassessment, and the tax bill stayed the same. The other property limit was $1 million assessed value. So for property that was held a long time, it was under that. 
and they could pass that to the kids without reassessment. This went on the ballot for voter approval, and it was approved by 75% of the voters. So that's a unanimous vote in the legislature, 75% of the voters, and now it's gone. It's gone because in the fine print of Proposition 19, they were repealed. Proposition 58 and a companion measure 10 years later that applied to grandparents and grandchildren if the children's parents were deceased. In that situation, they had the same rules as a parent child. That was removed from the Constitution. And in its place is this language in Prop 19 that says everything's reassessed to market value except a parent's principal residence if it becomes the child's principal residence within one year and if the new additional value above the assessed value doesn't exceed a million dollars plus the assessed value, then the tax bill would stay the same. There wouldn't be this big tax increase. Well, that has not worked out very well. First of all, many people can't drop everything and move into their parents' home just to keep the tax base. So they end up with the reassessed tax bill. And the other thing is that the, um, the other properties, a small apartment building, a small business, the other half of a duplex, those are reassessed to market value with no break at all. So it has really not worked out very well. And that $1 million cap doesn't go very far in some of these coastal areas for a long held property that maybe has a $200,000 assessed value. It would only be covered for no tax increase up to 1.2 million, if you're following me. Uh, and then if it's actually worth, let's say 2.2 million, then that extra million dollars is taxed at 1%. That's added to the old assessment and you wind up with a huge tax increase, even if you do what the realtor's measures said you have to do, which is move in, you still get a tax increase. So it's been really brutal. Even for people who want to sell an inherited property, for the year that it takes to settle the estate and list the property and close escrow, you owe the property taxes on that current market value as of the date of transfer. And trusts do not protect you from this, People always ask, do trusts protect you? No, they don't, because the assessors look through the trust. They look through the trust to the present beneficial owner. It's always been the case that they do that, but people didn't know because Prop 58 was protecting them on their parent-child transfer, and they, maybe they thought it was the trust, but it wasn't. So now it's gone. So here you see an, in, an example of inherited property. So an original owner purchased two homes for $1,000 each, $100,000 each. One is the primary residence and one is investment property. Uh, the current assessed value would, um, we're assuming it's about 200,000. That's due to that Prop 13, 2% cap on the annual increases over the years. And so the current property taxes come out to a little over 1%. So we're counting at about 1.1%. Uh, because it's 1% plus a few local things. So say it's about 2,200 for each of them. Um, if the current market value were to go up to 1.8 million, which is pretty close to median sale price in San Mateo County, and it's actually been higher. So median sale price in San Mateo County has been more like 1.9 or 2 million. Um, then, and so assume that that's happened with both homes and the owner now passes away and leaves the property to either their children or to the grandchildren, assuming that the parents of the grandchildren are deceased. So what we see happening here is for a primary residence, and granted this has to be the primary residence of both the transfer and the transferee. Um, so if this is a situation for primary residence, the assessed value is um, 200,000, which is that assessed value I showed earlier, um, plus $1 million, which is that exception or exemption that they're bringing in for primary residences. So that gives you 1.2 million. So as long as the, um, as long as the mark current market value is 1.2 or less, then there's no change in the property taxes. But if it's higher, and in our example, we said it went up to 1.8 million, now there's a difference of 600,000. So that difference of 600,000 is added on to the current original assessed value, 200,000, and now you have an $800,000 new assessed value. So for, even for primary residents, the annual property tax has gone from 2,200 to 8,800, just, just with that. Um, and that's not an uncommon occurrence in our area. Um, I'm pulling in an example that's pretty uh, true numbers to what we've been seeing. For inherited property, so anything outside of that, that just uh, previously there was an um, exemption for 
up to $1 million of assessed value. And now that's going to be just completely reassessed. So it would be uh, reassessed to full market value of 1.8 million. And that increases, if you take that same tax rate, increases from $2,200 to 19,800. So we're talking about a 10 time difference. So just to put that, I, I thought this would be helpful just to put it into numbers so that mm -hmm. you can see the impact that it has on people. So um, it's the I'll it's the it largest the largest property tax increase in the history of California. I don't think the voters were told that. I don't remember yeah. that being in the commercials. And, and that's 10 times for some properties. And that's not uncommon. It's, right. it's a very common occurrence. So I'll, I'll give it back to Shelley. I mean, to okay. Susan. OK, so so you're exactly right, Jean. It does force the heirs to sell inherited property when they don't necessarily want to. And in many cases, these are families that have been counting on that rental income for specific purposes like paying medical bills for a family member or paying for assisted living for an older family member. And they had this all worked out and they had it in a trust and they thought they were done. They had everything taken care of. And here comes Prop 19, which, by the way, they finished counting the votes in December of 2020. It took effect in the middle of February 2021. Over the Christmas holidays, in the middle of a pandemic, with the government offices closed, people could not get answers to their questions. They could not get their estate attorneys or their trust attorneys on the phone. It was horrific, mm -hmm. horrific. Bad for the assessors, bad for the property owners, bad for the lawyers, horrific. And it didn't have to be like this. You know, we don't need this tax increase. It was supposed to fund the firefighters. So far, it has funded the firefighters to the exact extent of zero. First year they did this, the the fire, the state fire wildfire fund account that they created got exactly zero from it because of the way the math works on it. There just was no extra money. And so it's not working and it's it's gotta go. It's mm -hmm. gotta go. Yeah. And um, one of the things that I've heard from some people is like, well, all they need to do is sell it. And, you know, one of the the major selling points, even for the realtors at the time was, well, we'll get more listings as people need to sell. Um, and uh, that was one of the, the support for it. But uh, I think, you know, people didn't see what the impacts could be on, um, you mentioned affordable housing, but I do have a, you know, a client who is dealing with that now we're um, having to deal with you know having a property that's in a very very low market rent a, a not market below market rate rents um, because they've had tenants for 30 or 40 years and with the property uh you know the mother just passed away last year the property when it's reassessed will not be able to account for the rents will not cover just the property taxes much less anything else so that's that's going to be that's a difficulty all around, even in terms of affordable housing. It's very harsh. And it, it comes up without warning because it because it happens when people pass away and it's the worst possible time to have to deal with these kinds of decisions and these kinds of problems. And there's just no reason for it. So we're going to get rid of it. Yep. So introducing the repeal the death tax initiative, introducing the repeal the death tax initiative. So what we are doing is we are restoring Prop 58 and we are restoring Prop 193. That's the parent child transfer from 1986 and the grandparent grandchild transfer. If the parents, if the children's parents are deceased, that was passed in 1996. We are restoring them. That's all we're doing. And we're adding retroactivity. So if someone was reassessed for a parent-child transfer while Prop 19 has been in effect, they would be able to get their original assessed value back again as if that reassessment had not taken place. So you would get back your trended base year value under Prop 13 before it was changed. And that's what this does. It restores the, the ability to transfer a principal residence of any value from parent to child and up to $1 million of assessed value of other property. And there are no rules about who has to live in it or for how long or anything like that. It's just the principal residence of any value and up to a $1 million of assessed value of other property transferred without having that count as a change of ownership and without reassessment and without any change to the tax bill. So that's what we're doing. So I should tell you how we're doing it. <laughs> We tried to do this last year. We did this the conventional way where we printed uh, eight and a half by 14 inch petitions and um, it had all the full text of everything, uh, which is one way to do it. 
And uh, we, we had people who were volunteers and did a great job. And we got about 425,000 signatures doing that. But we ran out of time. We just ran out of calendar. So this time we did something different. This time we created a one-page petition. And this is it. This is the entire thing, top to bottom. It fits on a single sheet of letter-sized paper. You can print it on any printer in your house, in your office, at Staples or Office Depot or anywhere else. You can make copies of it. You can distribute it to everyone you know. This is the repeal the death tax official petition that will get this measure on the November 2024 ballot. So to get this, you go to repealthedeathtax.com, repealthedeathtax.com, and you see the link there. Click here to download the official petition right now. Uh, just a note, it's not an electronic petition. Electronic signatures are never valid to get anything on the ballot. Never in California. It's got to be paper and ink. So you download this PDF and you print it out. And here's what you get in the PDF. You get a cover sheet right here. And the cover sheet has a little bit of information about what it is, a list of what's in the PDF, a mailing label, which you can see right there. And we also have a little set of reminders of what you should make sure of before you seal the envelope to make sure that everything was done correctly. So that's the first page. The second page is the instructions. It's as easy as one, two, three. Right there you can see we have the illustrated blue and red arrows and blue ink. We have illustrated what, what everything is. Everybody has to be a registered voter to sign the petition. So that's why it says Valerie Voter and Victor Voter. And it has to be your residential address. So I've written in the 123 Home Street, home address, and then the residential city, residence city, right there, and the zip code. So first you write in the county, that's that's the one. First you write in the county where everybody who's signing this is a registered voter, so we can get it to the right county, so it can be a verified signature. Then you fill in the voter signatures, very simple, print, sign, address, address, and then you have to fill in the declaration of circulator. Now the declaration of circulator is what the person with the clipboard in front of the supermarket would normally have to fill out. But this time you're the circulator. You're the circulator of your own petition. So you sign it, you are also the circulator. So you fill this out, your name, your address, the dates that you collected the signatures, and then the date that you're signing the declaration and your signature. And that's it, that's it. Then you go back here and you cut out the little label, tape it to an envelope, mail it back. Also inside to make things easier is a flyer. Hold on. Here's the flyer. Now you're going to talk to your neighbors and your neighbors are going to say, why should I sign this? And this will help you. This is our flyer that's inside the PDF, page three, I think it is. So what it says is that parents should be able to transfer their home and limited other property to their children without triggering reassessment and a huge tax increase. That's it. And then there's more, you know, voters were tricked into removing it because they weren't told about this. The repeal the death tax initiative restores this important protection for California families. There won't be an unexpected unaffordable tax hike and renters benefit because buildings are not reassessed with a huge tax increase when somebody passes away who happens to be a mom and pop landlord. Down here we have these uh, QR codes and links. This is register to vote. Check your voter registration if you want to look up did you register to vote with a middle initial or you didn't use a middle initial and you're not sure or you moved and you don't remember which address is on there, you can go and update everything at check voter registration right there. And then here's a QR code for the website and a QR code for the site to donate to the campaign if you want to help us buy radio commercials and get this thing passed. Uh, then we get to the top funder sheet. The top funder sheet, is a, this is a new requirement in state law. Everybody who signs the petition has to be shown the top funder sheet. So as soon as you open the PDF, we're off the hook. You have seen the top funder sheet. All it says is that this is being paid for by Repeal the Death Tax, a project of the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. That's it. If, it, if we were being funded by evil corporation number three had headquartered in some foreign country, it would say it there, but we're not. We're just being funded by the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association's committee, which is called Repeal the Death Tax. So that's what it says. Now and you've seen that. Yeah, and you mentioned, Susan, that that changes every, um, the date? Every has month, right. This has to be updated by law. This have to, has to be updated every month. So this one is for September. And on October 1st, we will update the one on the website so it'll be current. So you can always go to the website and get the current one if the one you have is out of date. 
Uh, and you don't have to return this to us. You don't have to give this to every person who signs it. You just have to show it to them. That's all you have to do. You can have one copy on the back of a clipboard and show it to them. Or if you're just signing this yourself, you can just look at it and say, yep, there it is. I've seen it. This is the petition. You'll notice in the signature blocks for the petition, it says, do not sign unless you have seen an official top funder sheet. That's what that was. You have seen it. There it is. Now you can sign. That's, that's a new state law. They're making, they're making things complicated to make sure we're not putting anything over on you. And we're not putting anything over on you. Quite the reverse. We're unputting things over on you. So this is the petition. It has the full text that the attorney general wrote, the title and summary. Then it's got the full text of the measure that you can read right there. Then it's got the two signature blocks and the declaration of circulator. And that's it. Just take that little mailing label from the first page, put it on the envelope, fold it up, mail it back to the Howard Jarvis Taxpayers Association. You can circulate as many petitions as you want to. You can, of course, only sign it once. It'll only be valid once if you sign it. But you can be the circulator and get other people's signatures as much as you want to. So you can print multiple copies of the petition. Uh, that you, The people you give it to can print multiple copies. If you're giving away the petition, please also give away a copy of the top funders list. Keep everybody legal. And that's it. It's very simple. Okay. And I, I put on the screen kind of a little summary of everything that Susan's already mentioned. Um, there are two signature blocks. Um, one thing to note, it has to be from the same county, right? Each right. One. Right. And the reason for that, it's, it's easy to remember. The reason is that we have to deliver these to the county and the county will verify whether everybody is on their voter rolls as a registered voter, because you have to be a registered voter for your signature to count. Uh, so if someone is a registered voter in San Mateo County and we deliver that petition to San Francisco, that signature won't be valid. It'll only be valid if we bring that particular one to San Mateo County. So if you have people who are in different counties, use two petitions. You know, just print more than one and say for the people going to San Francisco County, for the people who are going to the election office in San Mateo County, just have them fill out one and write in the county that we're supposed to deliver it to right there. And um, are there, um, I do see a question, but if you could just finish off the petitions in terms of, um, are there any common mistakes that you've seen or? Well, know? common mistakes would be forgetting to sign it um, or writing an address that's not your residential address where you are registered to vote. Mm -hmm. When these go back to the counties, they have clerks who sit there at screens. These are all scanned and they're looking at screens and they're, they're trying to just match the signature on the petition to the voter roll. So the thing that, that you have to remember when you're doing this is, is it legible? Is it clear? Is it the home address where they're registered to vote? You can't use whiteout or correction tape because that looks like someone tampered with it. So that will make it invalid, but you can cross it out and you can have the person sign the next block. That's fine. Uh, but just make sure that it's all legible and it's all in more or less the right place. This is print name, signature, street address, city. I'm told that if people flip the, the street address in the city, that does not make it invalid. Something, okay. something that uh, some people ask me frequently is, is it okay to abbreviate the city? And the answer is kind of the same as what I just said. It, they're trying to just validate that this is the voter that is on the petition is also on the voter roll. If you live in a city that has a very common abbreviation like SF for San Francisco, that's fine. If you live in a, in a county, in a city that has a less common abbreviation, it's probably clearer to write it out. But you are using the zip code also, so it's probably fine, even abbreviated. It doesn't make the signature invalid, but we're just trying to make it easy for the clerks to verify that the signatures are registered voters. And um, someone asked, if you signed last time, uh, do you have to sign it again? Yes. Thank you for asking. Yes, you do. That was last year's petition. It was different. This is a brand new petition. And this is a new, we start the clock over again at zero signatures. So yes, please sign this petition. And if you signed any electronic petitions, that does not count. So if you, that's, that's a mailing list kind of thing. So if you signed electronically, you haven't signed. Sign the paper petition. And um, I oh, and um, you want people to send them should if people are collecting petitions, you want them to send them now or you want them to wait, hold off and send it all send, together? Send them as fast as you can. Uh, we are trying to get this done as fast as we can. So please send them more than once, you know, send them every week, send them every two weeks. If you're collecting signatures, send them frequently to us. 
Uh, we have to tell the Secretary of State when we get to 25% of the required number. The required number is about 875,000 and change. So when we get to 200,000 and change, we have to tell the Secretary of State that we reach that level. Uh, and we wanna reach it as fast as we can. And I think part of it too, is you were mentioning, you have somebody on staff who is actually checking through and making sure that it was done correctly. Is we that... do. We, we have someone who is now spending full time. We thought it was going to be part time, but it's been full time because there's been so much mail uh, full time, just opening the envelopes. And if we have time, we will send back anything that has a mistake to the person and say, please do it again. We'll send them another petition and mm -hmm. say, please fix this error. Uh, but right now we're just opening them and stacking. We're opening and counting and stacking, checking just lightly to see if everything's essentially in completed mm -hmm. uh, and going as fast as we can because we're getting a little overwhelmed already and we've only been at this for a couple of weeks. I think a lot of people um, are aware of it now, so that helps. Um, there's also a question, can one person that got several positions signed, petitions signed by different people send them in or do they need to be sent in by each person who signs them? They, they should be sent in after the declaration of circulator is completed. So if you're the, if you're the circulator, uh, then you fill in, after they sign, you fill in the declaration of circulator and then you can send it in. If they are going to be the circulator, if you're giving them blank petitions and they're the circulator, then they can send it in themselves or they can give it back to you. But whoever witnesses the signature is the circulator. So if you give someone a blank petition and you don't witness the signature, but they witness their own signature, they are the circulator. They should sign the declaration of circulator and then they can give it back to you to deliver back to us. And again, you can be a circulator for um, uh, and have many petitions because there's many only petitions. two signatures. That's uh, right. On each. Um, and as, many as a seen. circulator, do you need to live in the same county? As you do not. A I circulator know. only has to be 18 years old. You don't have to be a registered voter. You don't have to be a California resident. You can you just 18 years old is all you don't have to be a citizen. 18 years old is the only requirement. But to sign the petition, you have to be a registered voter. And uh, there's a question on, uh, so you, I think, I'm not sure if you mentioned, but the deadline uh, that you deadline. have, as well as how many are you Right. Looking? We need 875,000 and change. We're going to try and get 1.3 million or more to make sure that we have enough valid signatures. Um, the deadline, we'd like them all back by January 16th. Our actual deadline to turn them into the counties is in February, but we need some time to count sort, process, make sure everything is ready to go. So we're asking everyone to get the petitions back to us by January 16th. So go to this website, um, the, the repealthedeathtax.com and share that link with other people because there are a lot of resources on there uh, that are yes. available. So. Yes, we have a frequently asked question link. It's underneath where the download link is shown there. You just scroll down a little bit, you'll see the frequently asked questions link. There are flyers, you can read the full text of the petition and uh, you can see a video of a press conference for a related measure. We tried to get the legislature to do this as a Senate constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. And so that was SCA four. They wouldn't do it for us. But uh, you can see the press conference of people talking about why this is so important. And this is a bipartisan effort. This is backed by both parties. This has nothing to do with left or right. This is family money and family security and taking care of your kids. And that's everybody. Uh, so there's a question. Do you need it postmarked by January 16th or delivered by January 16th? Which... Close enough either way. We just okay. we would like to have it's it. We'd like to deadline. have it back in our office. Not a hard deadline. We'd like to have it back in our office by the middle of January. So that gives us time if we're very close to what we think we need and we need to double down and do something really, you know, on an emergency basis, more advertising, more whatever we need to do. That'll give us a couple of weeks to do that. Um, and if we have more than enough, then we're going to need time to process it because it's so much paper. And we are, we're everybody on the Howard Jarvis staff, and there's only a grand total of 10 of us in two cities. We're in Sacramento and Los Angeles. There's only 10 of us. Uh, we, were, we are all doing this as a, just a little part time on the side of our regular jobs, uh, except we have one contractor who is just assigned to opening the envelopes, and that has been full time. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need some time to process all this paper in January. So just get it to us in the middle of January and we'll be good. Okay, sounds good. Um, so uh, there is a question that came in. So I wanted to cover all the petition questions, but there's a question that came in about uh, just in general, the, the, the initiative itself. So um, there's already so much resentment regarding property and rental owners. Uh, will this be considered a tax, per tax perk for the rich? How would you answer that? 
Well, I'll tell you what, it's not just the rich. This is not mansions. You know, in, in cities in here in Los Angeles, in a city like Englewood, which has this long history where for, for many decades, people could not even own property. Communities of color could not even own property. And now they do. And now a stadium was built nearby and the value of that property really went up, which is great news unless you inherit it and now you owe property taxes on a house that's worth this, this wild multiple of what your parents paid for it. So what are we doing? We're forcing this generation, which should be enjoying the property and keeping the property, which will continue to appreciate most likely, we're forcing them to sell it. Now, sure, they get the money from the sale, but the money loses value to inflation and the property appreciates and somebody else owns it. How is that fair? And how is it fair to all the tenants in all the mom and pop buildings that are under rent control when these are inherited and the new tax bill is completely unaffordable and the kids who now own the building have to sell it because they can't make that business pencil out and they can't afford to subsidize the business any longer. So they have to sell. Well, then what happens? Well, then those units are withdrawn from the market because no one can make it pencil out at those rents. So those units are withdrawn from the market and that means the tenants are evicted. That's the harsh word for it, they're evicted. How does that help? So this is not just about protecting the rich. This is about protecting everyone in California who has invested 30 years of mortgage payments into owning property. This is for regular people. This is three bedroom houses up and down the state that regular people have purchased and paid for and maintained and paid taxes on and want to leave to their kids. And maybe their kids want to keep it as income property and they should be able to do it. It's their property. Um, as you mentioned, it was interesting because I was talking to one of my clients who um, has is in this situation, as I mentioned before, and his response was, I'm going to go get my tenants to sign this petition because exactly. it's going to impact them more than it's going to impact him. And exactly. so I think that's something to really keep in mind that this whole idea of affordable housing and a lot of below market rate housing, maybe from tenants who've been there uh, with a good relationship for years now, you know, through no fault of anybody, they're ending up having to uh, leave, you know, you're losing evicted. those units. Exactly. Yeah. What's going to replace them? If that building is demolished, what's going to replace them? Well, it's not going to be apartments with that same rent for sure. So we're losing affordable housing through this and that doesn't help anybody. That is just not helpful in any way. And what about the small businesses? What if you were a family that came to the United States from another country and you opened a small business, like maybe a restaurant, and you work for two generations to build it up and you own that property and then the kids inherit the property and that property is reassessed to market value. And you are a restaurant that has just come through the COVID pandemic and you probably have all this debt because you had to go build a patio so you could serve outside and you have all of these loans that you have to pay back and all of those lost, all the lost revenue from those years. And then boom, this, your property taxes become completely unaffordable. Well, what happens to that restaurant? What happens to that family? This was a viable business and this tax increase is going to put it into its grave. This is why we call this a death tax. It's a death tax for businesses. It's a death tax for families. It's worse than an estate tax because an estate tax you pay once, but the property tax is every year as a condition of keeping what you already own. And that is just cruel. It is just cruel and, and it was not good policy to put this into Prop 19 with those other provisions. The other provisions are fine, and we're not changing any of that. We're not changing the part that helps wildfire victims. We're not changing the part that helps seniors who want to move to a new home. We're not changing any of that. Just this, just the tax increase. We're going to take out the tax increase and put back the old rules which protected families. Thanks. And, and all of you can tell Susan is very um, passionate about this. And so thank you for sharing that with us. And we. Um, I think, I mean, everybody, especially as, as a real estate agent, I deal with actually, I've had several clients that I've met who are feeling the impacts of this now. So I think there are tons of stories. Again, if you go to the website, I've been keeping this up there, but um, really important, if you go to the website, there's uh, the video as well, the presentation, and there are a lot of stories that you'll hear about people who have been negatively impacted 
um, in, impacted by this. I think the really, really rich, I don't know what, what that category is anymore, but um, have attorneys and, uh, you know, accountants who can help them get out of it. So that could um, be, you it know. could be. So this affects yeah. regular people, it affects regular people, people who, who don't, who, right, who are just investing in real estate the way you should be able to, to, because it's always a good investment to invest in real estate. Yeah. We're, we're going to we're going to fix this. All you have to do is really easy to spread the word. Email the link to everyone you know. Repeal the death tax dot com. The material on there will always be up to date. You don't have to send them the PDF. Repeal the death tax dot com. Email that to everybody. And um, someone's asking, um, are there any stats on how Prop, T Prop 19 has impacted the market since going into the effect? I don't I, have any stats like that. Do you have anything I, like that? I don't. And that's really hard to quantify because it's going to be, um, I mean, as it is, the real estate market is uh, has been uh, very low inventory overall. There's been a shortage of inventory. So how many uh, sales that there are, it's it's not like a you can't just simply go, well, there were this many sales before Prop 19, right. there's this many after. Um, that's difficult to say because inventory levels have actually been on the very low side over the last year. So um, there's no way to do, uh, really yeah. quantify that. I think it's there, more about just stories that you hear. Right. There are a lot of a lot of factors that affect whether it's a good or bad idea to buy or sell real estate. One is interest rates. Interest rates are up. Uh, that makes things less affordable. Inventory is down. That tends to push prices up. So that makes everything less affordable. And then this huge tax increase, that doesn't help either. So altogether, it's it's kind of a brutal time for everybody in the real estate industry. And I just don't think that this tax increase was, was well thought out. Uh, and I don't think it was necessary. And I don't think voters were fully informed about it. I know they weren't. And I think that it's only fair to put it back on the ballot in the daylight and let voters decide whether they want those old rules back that passed with 75% approval in 1986 or whether they want this that squeaked through with 51%, even with all of the other things that were in it that were positive. Uh, has anyone challenged Prop 19 yet? In court? I think that's what we're trying to do, but is it in court? Has there yeah, been... there, there has not been a challenge in court. Um, several people asked us if it was possible to challenge it on the single subject rule. Uh, propositions are supposed to be a single subject, but the way the courts have interpreted the single subject, they say if everything is germane to everything else, then it's close enough. So our, our lawyers looked at that and said it, it would not be a successful challenge. Okay, okay so with that, um, with that, I'll go ahead and call the um, seminar to a close, but thank you everyone for joining us and thank you really to Susan for um, being with us today and helping to explain uh, you know, the, the Prop, Prop 19, as well as the Repeal the Death Tax Initiative. Again, the um, signatures we're looking for 1.3 million, 1.2 to 1.3 million by January 16th. So if you do uh, support it and want to, uh, you can go to that website. I kept that on for a while, uh, but it's easy to remember. It's just repealthedeathtax.com. So if you go to that website, you can download the petition. You can also email the link to uh, people that you know, and this is throughout California. So it's not restricted to just us here, whether you're in San Mateo County or in Sacramento or otherwise, it's throughout California, it's going to be the same petition. So please help uh, spread the word on that. And if people have more questions, you know, definitely, you can go to the website, you can, um, and reach out to the um, HJTA. Folks sure, as well. you can, you can email me Susan at HJTA.org. Thank you, Susan. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Thank you all. Bye.